Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to uh, almost the end of February. But we do get an extra day this year because of those leap years. You know, it's funny. I don't think I actually ever had, like, a friend or a colleague that was born, like, on that leap year day. Like, how does that work? They only get a birthday once every four years or something? I don't quite know how that works. I think you get to decide the day before or the day after. Or both. You get to do both. Yeah, you get birthday Yeah, right. So, I um, so my daughter and my wife, like, one's on the twentieth, one's on the twenty fourth, blah blah blah. So it's like we celebrate the birthday the whole month, <laughs> right? Because you know we're spread apart, and so, but um, but yeah. So today's conversation, right, is is all around. I mean, what are we talking about? I think our friend Jesse said it right. Correct. How about try 500 tools? That's how many I have in my stack. <laughs> today, today uh, we're talking about tools. And uh, let me do this here real quick. Connor, say hello. Uh, introduce yourself. Hey, I am Connor. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Fit Security. We do awareness training. We build awareness training programs for MSPs. And I've been doing that for almost four years now. <laughs> That's awesome. <clears throat> and as an MSP, when we I was at the MSP, we standardized on Finn because they made it simply easy for us as an MSP to deploy security awareness training and phishing simulation. I'm Tim Golden, now founder of Compliance Scorecard. We're all official as of yesterday, so no more risk.io. We'll be transitioning that website away and moving towards compliancescorecard.com. Pretty excited about our new look. A little softer logo, a little softer than that big scary word risk, right? And since we are building out scorecards, it kind of made all sense. And so enough about me. Let's talk about tools and compliance. And Connor, talk a little bit about, uh, you know, your thoughts around like tools that they should be considering or, you know, how do we go th even through a process and all? So... If you missed our chat last week, to recap it in a, as short, in as few sentences as possible, is there a difference between creating a security program that achieves compliance versus security? And the answer is yes, but not necessarily. Like you can have both <laughs> compliance and security, but that just because you have compliance doesn't mean you have the other and vice versa. And mm -hmm. I've had so many debates with uh, not only you, but other MSPs, partners of ours, just people that I uh, end up <laughs> talking to and friends of ours like Wes Spencer, Kyle Christensen and Ray Orsini about like, cool. well, how do you know that you're creating security? And uh, a buddy of mine, Reg Harnish, he stated the following to me. He said, if you ask anyone how they create, how they know they're creating security for their clients and they start by listing off the tools that they use, they don't even know what they're doing. It's like they don't have security. Security does not start with a tool. Security starts with an outcome you'd like to create and you leverage tools to create that outcome. And all of that boils up to a statement that I say all the time. If you don't tell a vendor what they what you need, they'll sell you what they have. It doesn't yeah. mean you're going to get the tool that creates security. It's going to mean you get the tool that they need you to buy. <laughs> That's it. Exactly. So exactly. And, and, you know, and I love that. And hey, Alan, thanks for popping in, at least for the few minutes you'll be here. The recording. Thanks so much. It'll obviously be here after the fact. But yeah, you know, Reg, Reg and I have been talking a lot lately as well. Right. You know, you mentioned Ray and others. And so. Yeah, when they when, you know, when I talk to, uh, you know, prospects, MSPs and whatnot, and they start lifting their stack. Right. We obviously want to make sure good fit. Right. Just like they as an MSP want to make sure their customers are good fit. Right. So when they start talking about, you know, tool X to do a assessment Y and blah, blah, blah. And I like back up a little bit and I first ask them, like, do you have the person? Do you have a champion? Do you have somebody in your MSP that's going to be dedicated to a particular piece of software or a particular piece of the business or a particular thing in your MSP. You have the champion, right? We always start with the people. And if you don't have the people, lots of other weird things happen, right? It's like buying a gym membership on January 1st 
and never talking to the personal trainer or never using the equipment, right? And that's unfortunate. It happens a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah. Connor, do you remember the stat or maybe there was a stat that talked about like the, the percentage of deployment and coverage of tools at an MSP. And I thought it was like less than like 30 some odd percent. Don't quote me on the number, but it's like, we have insert compliance scorecard or fin or whatever other tool but it's only on two of our 500 customers um that adoption piece doesn't happen right and i i forget do you, do you remember what the stat was i don't remember what the stat was but i it's don't remember it exactly but yeah. anecdotally i can tell you most partners that i work with don't deploy their tools to their user base or their clients yeah. um They'll buy it. You honestly, the, I see two scenarios happen way too often. Uh, mm -hmm. A high level tech, or maybe somebody who's in management, of the company makes it a pet project to buy X vendor and use it in Y clients. So they do that, and then halfway through the deployment, they're oh, I ain't got time for this. I got my other job to worry about. <laughs> uh, and the second is, in order to sign a client, an MSP wants like we need this client. What are they asking for? It's like all right, we need to go buy this tool, and then you only utilize it for that client. Well, what did you just do? Well, now you have to train your techs on how to use two tools. Now you got to make somebody specialize in this because there's a whole other tool that they're not used to deploying. Now you got to make sure it's managed correctly. So now that person needs to keep spending time educating themselves, almost like going through some kind of continuing education process. It's like mm. it's just you've you've now doubled the complexity of your service offering to get a single client. Um, yeah, we do see that a lot. You know, it's interesting because you know compliance, obviously, what we do, but we do way more than that, and it's interesting, like. Oh, yeah, I know you have an assessment module, but we do assessments over here. Then why do you need us? You don't need me. Like, if you're yeah. doing that work in some other tool, I'm not going to sell you my product, right? And so, you know, as you start to think about your tool sets in your MSP, you know, I mentioned earlier having a champion, right? And not necessarily, as Connor just said, a pet project for one client, but actually bringing this into your corporate culture and making it part of your day to day activities, right? You would probably never have and get rid of your RMM tool. Why? Because you're dealing with it almost every day or your PSA tool because you're dealing with your tickets almost every day, right? So that adoption rate having the buy-in sort of corporately, I think is key to being successful with any tool that you buy. Um, you know, for, for a while now, I've kind of seen things around like, are they the starting point? You know, are they, you know, how should they approach, you know, implementation with security tools, all that kind of stuff. I have always advocated for, the following. First and foremost, I do not consider myself a security expert. So, you know, take, <laughs> take what I'm saying with a with a grain of salt or in fact, you know, make it a mountain. Get, you know, get your weight in salt or whatever the phrase was. Um, but I, I would I would always say this, even though we hounded last week on compliance, is not security, blah, 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 blah. Don't don't do this. Uh, don't don't make the mistake. It's still a great place to start. Compliance mm -hmm. frameworks and uh, other closely related things like the CIS controls, which is not necessarily a framework, but it's like really good, as you mentioned last week, guardrails. It's, it's like, hey, yeah. you're not going to go into the, we're not You're not necessarily going to bowl a strike here, but you're not going to go in the gutters. And that's important. Um, right, we put the bumpers up. That's how I bowl. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, it's a great place to start. And all of those compliance frameworks are an approximation for creating actual security. They exist because... The people who are responsible for maintaining those frameworks, for auditing companies that are compliant with those frameworks, they believe that they are creating actual security in some capacity. So I've always made the recommendation, go to a very popular framework like NIST 800-171 or straight up just go to, you know, NIST, read through NIST CSF or the cybersecurity framework and say, okay, what are all the things that NIST would, in, in, in you know, insert any case, recommend we do. And then you can do the same thing with the CIS controls and you can say, all right, there's 18 domains of security here. Why is that? Well, th the answer is way smarter people than me decided that those were the 18 unique domains that needed securing. And that's how it happened. It's like, all right, let's start there and see what we get. 
Mm -hmm. I would even back that up and hate to word the, use the word dumb it down, but you know, our good friends at Fifth Wall talk about this all the time. Five things for cyber insurance, right? Are you doing backups? Are you yeah. doing a next gen AV? Are you doing are you doing security awareness? Wait, over here? Do you yeah. over here? Yeah, over security there. awareness yeah. training, right? Are you doing, you know, there's five basic things even for cyber insurance, compliance frameworks, mouthful of acronyms aside, like just to be able to work with your customer to better get them insured and help reduce their insurance rates. Yep. You know, five simple things that you could be doing. Vulnerability management. Are you doing something? There's plenty of tools out there. You know, we have partnerships with, with Connect Secure, Nodeware, Cyber, like a bunch of them. Uh, security awareness training, Finn, uh, hello, insert Finn. Um, next gen AV. I mean, how many people have Huntress deployed or Sentinel One deployed? Right. So I'm going to I'm going to throw that out. There's like, you know, a bunch of people here on the live stream. I'm actually going to throw this out to the audience. Uh, if you have next gen AV, EDR, MDR, all the DRs, Give me a thumbs up, say yes or no, put it in chat. Let us know, um, are you doing next gen AV for your customers? Yeah. Are you doing backups for your customers? Do you have security awareness training? I'm trying to figure out what side you're on for your customers, <laughs> right? Two-factor authentication, right? Um, let us know in chat, you know, come on and, and tell us, are you doing these things? Basic, really simple things, right? And I think I read somewhere like 60, 70, 80% of MSPs, of the MSPs, 60 to 70% of that deployment is a Microsoft ecosystem. Yeah. So even if you don't go buy all the amazing, great backup tools, you know what comes with that? Azure Backup, right? Azure Backup, Azure Site Risk. Yeah, it may be a little plan change, but you can get backup right out of your Microsoft. Now, is it the best? Is it the greatest? Probably not, but you've now checked one box on that cyber liability insurance. That is true. Uh, those yeah. five things for folks you listen to that Tim's mentioning, those are the five most common things that uh, at least Reed and, and Dustin from Fifth Wall have seen all cyber insurance policies that are written in the recent past and will continue to be written in the near future require. So it's like mm -hmm. they the, the phrase they've used is like, this is the you must be this tall to ride line, you know, that you see at Hershey park or on a roller coaster or something. I, I'm up in the Northeast. So, you know, I got a reference. Hershey. Hershey, Hershey park. I haven't been there since I was like eight <laughs> years old. <laughs> um, That's and, and it's those five things next, like you said, next gen AV backups are in their MFA awareness training. Uh, and then some kind of EDR slash endpoint monitoring solution. It's like, mm -hmm. they're going to look at that. Your answer to those questions and say, you don't have these come back when you do goodbye. There's a whole host of other questions like cyber insurance yeah. questionnaires are insane at this point, at least the ones that I've been able to see. Uh, yeah, but those, are, just, those are the five. Yeah. Just throw that anywhere. <laughs> Sorry. I, instead of a fidget spinner or like playing with a pencil or something. You mean I like play this? With, yes. Yes. I play with <laughs> poker chips. Oh, poker chips. So I just have a stack usually, of poker chips. Yeah. I usually just play with like my business cards. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but I guess I have a fidget spinner too. So, um, you know, uh, you mentioned fifth wall. I'm going to give a little shameless plug. I try not to do this at all, if ever, but we're pretty excited about our new integration with fifth wall in our platform. Um, you know, fill it out once with your customer, get it to their Lord of the apps. Like we're pretty excited about. So shameless plug, sorry, moving right along. Um, yeah, so there's a couple of other questions we were circling around the drain here in the green room, like, um, you know, what roles do tools play in, you know, ensuring your your security or your compliance? What what roles do tool, tools play in your MSP for around your security and compliance? We mentioned five for cyber liability, but what else? Well, there are a host of other tools um, that you could buy, right? Every vendor will ask you to buy more of their tool. There's the current huge debate going around, uh, you know, vendor consolidation versus buying the best in class in every unique tool category. Um, mm -hmm. and one thing I'd, I'd caution, caution anyone who's trying to create a security program 
on is don't start with the tools. Don't start with the vendors is, uh, you know, to go back to the statement I made, let's say you do start by looking at the CIS controls and you look at all the 18 domains. Those are roughly sorted by uh, order of diminishing return in terms of what is the cheapest, quickest way to get the most amount of security. Go to domain one. What is the second cheapest and most go to domain two. Um, so it's like, those those things uh and as uh who said it the best they're like uh, an untested backup means you don't have any <laughs> yeah pretty much it's like uh, yeah, yeah. have you ever stored from those recently yeah, John, yeah jonathan brought up azure backup i just used azure as an example like the category is backup right making sure that you're backing things up whether it's datto or azure any of them so yes uh the some you know your mileage may vary right so yeah. having backup is you know one of the key indicators for cyber liability insurance so yeah um yeah and exactly jonathan that's you know so cis it's it's it, it's iterative right it's it builds upon itself like the very first thing is figure out what you have and where is it you know ig1 asset management what do you have and where is it ID2, how are you protecting it? How are you dealing with it? And all the way through to, you know, the ominous $99 pen, who did I say that? The pen test. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you did say it, Tim. I was here. <laughs> right. And the penetration test, you know, if we are doing an actual red team, blue team, blah, blah, blah team penetration test, you know, you can literally spend thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars for that engagement. Whereas, your RMM or even AD can help you determine even things like uh, Slitherus from Komodo Labs, which is a free network scanner, or, or Run Zero. I mean, if you don't have PSA tools or things, there are plenty of free things to scan your internet devices and find out where they are and what they are, right? IG1, you can kind of do for free, even though MSPs have tools that do it far better. <laughs> That is right. true. Um, I remember <laughs> talking to a buddy, of, another buddy of ours, Jason Salego, and his statement was along the lines of, "If you're losing sleep because you're you feel your client is insecure, you haven't done enough." And there are people, you know, for those of you listening, some of you will take that way too far, right? Yeah. You'll think of some black swan event that'll happen once every thousand years in all of humanity, and be like. Mm -hmm. Oh, we're not protected against that. That's not what he was intending. What he was intending to say is, let's say you tell your client they need to enable MFA on all accounts. And then every single C-suite individual, every single stakeholder that you talk to over at your client says, we're not doing that for us. Good luck. Well, does that make you uneasy? It should, because right. they're the people that are the most targeted, have the most access, and in my own personal experience, are the least qualified people to actually exhibit secure behaviors. Yeah, I would agree that, you know, we've seen challenges with the executive levels, not one, you know, I've seen both extremes, to be honest with you, I've worked with a, a couple of really great customers as an MSP that were like, I don't want access to anything. In fact, I don't even really want email, but I kind of have to have it. And so, you know, but they were also smart enough to recognize like you have as the MSP, the keys to the kingdom. What happens when you win the lottery or get hit by a bus or leave? Like, so, you know, they brought up the whole break glass account, right? They brought it. So I've worked on that end of the spectrum where they knew enough, but they didn't quite know, like, break glass accounts are a real thing, right? And there's PAM solutions and identity access management solutions that can help with that, right? We won't obviously be tossing out tool names, anymore, but... I've had both ends of the spectrum on the C-suite, you know, those that were kind of got it and wanted to have that buy-in and those with that were like, absolutely not, and fought for years to actually do 2FA. And I think we talked about this last week. Part of that is because of the inconvenience part. I don't want to be inconvenienced. I am on the golf course. I want to get my email and I don't want to have to click seven buttons to do it. Who's answering email on a golf course? Not not me. <laughs> or a text or whatever. Leave the phone <laughs> in the car. You're on the course. Exactly. Exactly. So um, I want to talk a little bit about, I know you, you, I kid you up earlier, but I'm going to talk about what I did when I was at my MSP. And I use the word I, I mean us, 
right? There is no I in team, but there isn't Tim. So <laughs> I'm learning nowadays not to use I and me anymore, but what we did when we were looking at tools, the very first thing that we did was, do we have a champion? Whether or not they know everything about whatever business problem we're trying to solve was not necessarily relevant, but who's going to spearhead this? Who's going to be able to do the work? And so, yes, we'll train them. Get, so pick the person. Doesn't even have to be your CISSP cybersecurity guru. Just have somebody that's accountable. The second thing that we did was determine our own requirements, right? Do we want to follow NIST? Do we, want, do we have to follow CMMC? Do we have to follow FedRAMP moderate? We had to know what our own requirements were and our customers' requirements and where those things aligned and didn't align and have to adjust and make exceptions for, yeah, no 2FA and the customer, like we had to make those, you know, adjustments to de develop our requirements list. You know, we, you know, we, we worked to replace a very key um, business uh, tool to, you know, they were doing research. They needed, like, they had SurveyMonkey. They used it for years and they loved it. SurveyMonkey changed on how and what they were able to collect data on, you know, personal information, kids, and blah, 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 while they worked in the education space and they were surveying kids. And SurveyMonkey changed their policy and was like, you can't do that anymore. So we now had to find a replacement business tool for them. One of the requirements was, COPPA, right? Being able to survey children under the age of 18. SurveyMonkey disallowed that. So we had, that was one of the requirements amongst all the security requirements. So find the person, define your requirements, align those to your client's requirements. Now you have a working list to be able to go to the vendor space, to go to the G2s and the review sites and the Google searches and all of that stuff to determine what tool will fulfill our requirements, not just from a security, but also from the business. Like we got to survey kids under 18 years old. None of that had to deal with, well, yes, it had to deal with security, but determine that list of requirements and then you can start your vendor hunt. Right. As an MSP, when I was looking to replace our security awareness training with the different, you know, with who we had in the past, first thing I needed to know was ease of use, you know, type of content. Uh, how are they delivered? Um, you know, do they have a phishing program? Right. I, you know, there were things that we determined that we thought were non negotiables. You know, and then, you know, at some point price factors into that, of course, as an MSP, um, we, we obviously we landed with Finn, as I, as I mentioned before, but we knew what we were looking for before we went hunting. That didn't mean I threw out our existing security training company. Right. We knew what we were looking for. And Connor, you might even remember some of the con conversations you and I had, what, two, three years ago when I was at the MSP about the things. Right. Yeah. It took two years to implement 2FA. Right. Uh, one over here. So to recap tool selection, have a human. Doesn't matter if they're a CISSP or not. Obviously, you want to align the human the best you can, but have a human. Determine your requirements determine your customer's requirements and find a happy medium. Then you can start your vendor hunt, your vendor due diligence, your pricing and everything else. Yeah. That's how we've been able to, you know, look at tools and actually use them and deploy them for everybody and get 80 to 90 to hundred percent usage rate of tools. It's true. So. Absolutely. Um, what other questions are popping up here? When you answer in cybersecurity, is it appropriate to say that you're using specific freeware? Yeah, so I think, Jonathan, this question might be uh, in regards to the cyber liability conversation we were having earlier. I don't want to answer that because I'm not the cyber insurance guy. But what I can do is go over and tag Will from Fifth Wall or Reed or one of those way smarter people in the cyber insurance than me. Um, but I don't want to answer 
and give you the okay. wrong information? I have a, uh, I have a quick answer on this. If sure. you're using, let's just throw out, you know, all the buzzwords. Let's say you're using the industry leading Gartner Magic Quadrant solution provider for EDR. Let's say it's CrowdStrike or something or Sentinel One or whatever. Um, and you answer a questionnaire saying, we use CrowdStrike. That's usually where the questions will end. It's like, oh, you do? Congrats. We're done. It's like, we're done here. You, We get that. We get what that means. Some of them might ask about implementation. The smart ones will, and they should. Because just because you buy a tool doesn't mean you use a tool. Um, yeah. There. Yeah. Uh, and then the, so your question about, okay, what if we have some homegrown solution or what if we use freeware is you'll almost certainly get questions about implementation. The thing that creates security is the actual implementation of the tool in the first place. So if you're trying to hide something, sure, you could probably get away with, you know, putting in the industry leading software, showing a purchase receipt, and you're done. Um, if you're using some kind of homegrown solution or some kind of freeware or other less known solutions that aren't considered industry leaders by these huge and often ill-sorted, uh, you know, ind industry stuff like Gartner or whatever, uh, you'll you'll probably just get a host of questions that come along with it. Yeah, and the other thing, I guess, I I, I would piggyback a little bit on that. Don't lie. Yeah, you don't either do, do it or you don't do it, and you know you're better off saying you don't do something because. You're yes. going to end up being held accountable at the end of the day. So. That is one thing Will and Reed and Dustin have told me is just because you answer no on a questionnaire doesn't mean that disqualifies you. It's just information they want to have. Yeah. Um, so always be honest because you'll pay for it one way or the other for sure. There might be a couple of, so they've been, uh, Fifth Wall has been on our peer group the last month and there, there are a couple of, I'm not going to, say them here because i'll probably screw them up but there are a couple of key questions that are like total disqualifiers i don't know what exactly they are but the fact of the matter is don't lie just answer as truthfully and you know honestly as you can so um, yeah um to go back on on how you selected tools for the folks of you listening whenever i did a sales call uh, for, for Finn, whenever I was trying to work with MSPs, I would ask them, Hey, do you have any acceptance criteria? And the list that Tim just mentioned is a, you, you know, you get the stakeholder, you survey what the current use cases are, you survey where the gaps that you'd like to address are, and that should arrive you at a set at, a, at a, honestly, a spreadsheet that has, this is our non-negotiable set of functionality. This would be super nice for us to have. This we'll ask questions about, but doesn't matter too much for us. Those would just be like extra fringe benefits. That set of criteria, if you don't show up to a conversation with any vendor in any product category and say, here is what I need you to do. Can you just check bo the box for yes or no in each single item? And if they, mm. you know, maybe give them a note section. Speaking from experience, I was a sales guy myself. Like, if you let me talk, I'll talk. <laughs> That's not what you want. <laughs> it's like If we know from the very beginning that all right, this is not multi-tenant from the start. So you'd have to manage a hundred different logins for your hundred clients to use this tool properly. Is that a non-starter for you? Well, if it is, you want to know that right away, right? Stop, don't waste your time. Don't waste, you're not a prospect at the end of the day anyway. You're a person who's never going to use that tool and you should tell right. them that from the very beginning. You know, Eddie says, fake it till you make it. A lot of people doing, a lot of people doing that these days. You know, the industry term is trunk slammer, but that's all right. Yeah. Did you say, did you say Trump slammer or trunk slammer? <laughs> I said, I said trunk slammer. <laughs> Sorry, Jonathan, no political commentaries. Um, yeah, you know, I, I often wonder when I was an MSP and I would walk into like the cold sales call, right? Because nine times out of 10, you go to the website, you kind of look over the list of stuff. I know what my requirements are. Then you have to fill out a form and get in their sales pipeline. And so I, I often wondered, did I drive salesmen nuts or was I like their best friend? Because I could literally go to them and be like, out of my list of things, tell me what you can and cannot do. I always appreciated it. You know, nine times out of 10, it was always, oh, let me get my CTO or CISO or some C-level person that like, I'm just the BDR. I don't know these questions. <laughs> so, but God. 
um, statement for, for all you folks listening or watching. This is an awesome sales tactic you can use. If if a client couldn't give me acceptance criteria, I'd send them my own acceptance criteria. And it mm -hmm. just so turns out that all of the things that I would suggest they, they value were all the things that we did extremely well, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not completely um, altruistic. It's very self-interested. But for a lot of MSPs, for a lot of partners who now work with us and are really satisfied, they didn't have a place to start. So yeah. when you're having these conversations with your clients and you say, hey, do you have anything that we should care about? You have to understand most of them have no idea what they should care about. So if you right. handed them that list, which could intersect very nicely with the list of things that you do incredibly well, you're mm -hmm. setting yourself up on the right foot and they view you as the expert. So yeah. that's why, you know, this whole question right here of this, um, of this entire webinar today, how do you know you're creating real security? Well, if that acceptance criteria you're giving to your client is defendable in that it creates a modicum of real security, your client thinks you're an expert, you're providing them a great set of recommendations, and there's a good chance they'll end up working with you as a result. So it's honestly a sales tactic too, at the end of the day. Yeah. So are we done here? Because you literally just like wrap the whole thing up and on a nice, pretty bow, right? Oh, did so, I? Uh, sorry. <laughs> oh, you're good. Because, because that's, I think the message we want to continue to bring home is... Yes, you can have tools, you know, tools, tools. Hold on. Wait a minute. Uh, I think our friend, I think our friend, like, uh, try 500 tools. Is that so many? <laughs> <laughs> our good friend, Jesse, he's going to yell at me for reusing that. But sure, you can have all these tools, right? But are those tools meeting not only your requirements as an MSP, but also your customers, right? And so are they, are they multi-tenant? Do you have to pay extra for SSO.tax? Do you have to pay extra for single sign-on or for two-factor, right? We know there's SSO.tax lists a bunch of them that you pay extra for that enterprise version or extra for that single sign-on stuff. You know, some of the very basic things, right? Um, and having, as Connor said, an acceptance criteria. You know, I wonder what... I'm like thinking out loud. I'm wondering if I should take my security awareness training acceptance criteria and put that on LinkedIn for people. Hmm. Do it. Because I'm actually going to kind of kind of align to Finn. So it might not be that bad of a thing. I just I like making free resources available to people. Um, maybe I'll think about putting. Well, actually, no, I'm not at the, that MSP anymore. And I don't want to use anything that might have been part of their staff. Yeah, I don't want to do that. So, but, but I'll give you another example. Adam <laughs> Evans, a buddy of ours, Adam Evans, super, Adam. super smart guy. He created acceptance yeah. criteria when he was evaluating us. And yeah. I asked him after the whole process was done, it's like, it would be really valuable for me to know where we did or did not line up with a mature buying process MSP uh, acceptance criteria. Could you send that to me? He goes, yeah, let's have a whole conversation about it. And we went through line by line. I was like, do you care if I steal this and send it to my prospective partners? It's like, this is incredibly valuable. This is more thoughtful than I could ever be. And that's exactly mm -hmm. how we got started is like a smarter person, much smarter than me said, this is what you should care about. And I was like, all of these make so much sense. I'm going to steal it. Okay. Yeah. And he didn't care. Yeah. Exactly. Well, you know, and, that, and that's, that's the other thing about loving this MSP community is that we're all willing to share and willing to grow and learn from each other. And that's why we yeah. do these webinars is for all of us to learn and grow and share amongst each other. Right. Yeah. But I would, I do love the idea of putting together, you know, kind of like a, a mock like acceptance criteria for a couple of different things, whether it's maybe the five categories for cyber insurance, that might be something good to think about. Um, I'll divert here for a second since we're talking tools and tools aligning to a framework. Uh, Y'all know Matt Lee? Give us a little thumbs up, right? So Matt Lee from PAX 8, um, I, I had the privilege of myself and a bunch of other way smarter people than me uh, participate in this, uh, this CIS to tool mapping project, this pet project, this really humongous thing with Bob Lee and Tim Schner and, and, and Steve Kellogg and Matt Lee and Veronica, all these really, really smart people looking at every single control in CIS and determining where a vendor can fit into and either 
full, partial, or facilitates that. And so you'll be seeing something coming out from Pax8, Matt Lee, and them, hopefully, with, you know, in the next couple of months, don't pigeonhole the date, on being able to pick tools and have vendors that are aligned to the CIS framework that are, I hate to use the word vetted, but vetted to say, yeah, you know what? Uh, you know, Finn ticks every box for IG14, right? Because security awareness training, Finn ticks every box. And it's not just Finn saying that, it's now this process that they put together some, you know, objective, third party saying, yeah, you know what, this is the criteria and this tool meets that criteria and, you know, either facilitates or fully or partially. Yeah. So that's, that was a really cool project that Matt's been working on this past, what, two, three months now. Are you familiar with that project at all, Connor? I am. I've not had conversations with the, with Matt about it, but um, I can, I know, I knew that it was happening. It, yeah, it's, um, you know, again, I had the privilege of, you know, being able to participate from time to, you know, as time allowed. But, you know, there's thousands of human hours put into this, right? And at the end of the day, it's going to really be able to help MSPs have uh, have that, quote, checklist or have that acceptance criteria when they're looking at vendor tools. Right? For at least the CIS so, controls. At um, least the CIS controls it's a good place to start defend uh, i'll put it this way it is a defensible place to start yeah yeah i mean you know as you start to dig into you know deeper frameworks cmmc you know fed ramp fed ramp moderate equivalent you know all those big fun fancy scary words i want to do cmmc and make millions of dollars but my tools can't support it mm. yeah so um at least the cis ones it's a good foundational start. And, you know, maybe over the years, it'll expand to other frameworks. You know, yeah. now that we have a, a methodology and a process in place to determine that. So, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Sorry. Hold on. For um, one of our next questions that we should definitely address is, how do you make sure that your security practices align with your clients' needs? specifically in regulated and unregulated business sectors for, I see Jonathan, Eddie, Clint, what could you tell us uh, roughly what size client, if it's small, medium, large businesses uh, that y'all serve? And that would give us, uh, well, at least some very specific examples of how to make sure your business, your clients needs align. Um, while you're doing that, I'll actually go through a very simple analogy that I went through last week with Tim. It's the the widget, the widget machine that makes the widgets in the widget factory. Um, at the end of the day, what should security actually do? Like, what should your security program create for your client? It needs to create some kind of outcome. That's why they're working with you. Usually, uh, it, from my understanding, MSPs are some. It's some of the most expensive relationships that small businesses have because of the breadth of services that you do. And if the backbone of modern small businesses is leveraging technology properly, well, guess who has to do that? All of you watching, the MSP has to do that. You, you have to be that technical resource. You have to be that security resource. And you have to make sure it's happening in such a way that your client has very little questions about it and feel really good about the relationship. It's very expensive, mm -hmm. very hard to do. And so the entire output of your security yeah. program, when implemented in the client properly, should allow them to continue business operations as if there is no impediment, right? So Tim already brought up a little bit of uh, com um, convenience for security. Technology software exists to make humans' lives more convenient. That's literally why it exists. So if you implement any kind of security that creates inconvenience, you are now taking away from the main reason why that technology was utilized in that client in the first place. It's something that you really need to be cognizant <coughs> of every time you create any amount of security. So at the end of the day, yeah, I see you asked the question there. At the end of the day, your job, your role when creating the security program is to allow their business to operate as if it doesn't exist. It's like if this all happens in the back, back room, uh, behind the scenes, you know, mm -hmm. interruptions to business are so small that maybe only one workstation knows about it at a time kind of deal. That's perfect. That is the exact output of a security program that you want. 
Absolutely. You know, it's interesting because I, you know, I started like digging in and building a course around business impact analysis, right? So a BIA helps you determine where your business risk is, right? So, you know, for us here in New Hampshire, tornadoes, not a thing, right? But in the Midwest, tornadoes taking out the building and we no longer have our, you know, our donut factory and, you know, our fryers are gone and all that fun stuff. Like it's a thing. Right. And so as I thought, as I started to dig through, like, what is this business impact analysis and does mom's donut shop with five people and a fry later really care about the tornado? Or somebody says over on Facebook, a wave, right? <laughs> They're taking it out, like whatever. Do they even really care about the tornado? Um, well, chances are they're probably not aware of it if they live in New Hampshire. But if they live in the Midwest, yeah, they're probably thinking about it. Just like, you know, I'll go back to the wave comment here. Just like those people that live on the coastline or below sea level, right? Um, understanding the business needs and determining if your if your friolator went down, right? Like we and you know what? People are buying fancy pants refrigerators now that are all connected to the internet and blah 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 blah. And they're get like, did you read something about toothbrushes getting hacked? Right? There was a recent article that came out about the electronic toothbrushes getting hacked. I don't know if it was clickbait or not, but everything's kept not everything but most things are connected to the internet nowadays and if your refrigerator is connected to the internet and you're an ice cream shop and you think it's really cool because you can monitor the temperature of your freezer remotely you know while you're on vacation and they get hacked and now you're all your ice cream and all your product melts like those are the things that businesses like can't conceptualize like that can actually happen, right? And so us as MSPs being able to go to Matt's ice cream shop, I'll take one out of Matt Lee's playbook and say, hey, I really love that new fridge and I'm glad that you had me get it on the internet for you, but you know what? Let's change the default password. Let's see if it has two factor. Let's see if we can limit it to only certain IP addresses or certain devices, right? Because you know, the ice cream shop and their freezer gets hacked that's probably an issue. Yep. You know, and I, oh, maybe he meant, or they meant wave as in hello. <laughs> I think so exactly what they meant. Yeah. I know, but I was trying to pull it in like with the, you know, disaster recovery piece. So um, it's funny because we do simulca simulcast on a bunch of different channels. And so Facebook doesn't ever really bring in who the people are so hey facebook user how are you <laughs> and i find myself getting drier and drier maybe i need to shut up or drink more get some water. so connor what other things around tool selection and security do you want to babble about no um go ahead no. a right um now. a subject that i talk about frequently on is vendor education so I'll, I'll point the I'll point out the following scenario that a lot of uh, MSPs that a lot of people uh, generally go through and it's you end up selecting the tools because you're getting some kind of education from the tool vendor who tells you this is secure in X, Y, and Z ways. Um, you go to their conferences. Some of the vendors are large, some of them are small, and you end up selecting the tools based upon the education that you receive from the vendor itself. Now, I'm not saying that that's bad, right? A lot of vendor vendor education or vendor-based education is very good. A lot of vendor education is very correct in actually creating security. I always advocate for being aware of competing incentives, though. So if you are getting education from a vendor, what does that vendor have to do? Well, they have to sell more of their tool. So what are they incentivized to do? We'll tell you anything to get... like. I get that they're not going to say, well, some vendors do say, we we prevent all breaches. Use us right now. It's like some do say that and they get rightfully spanked publicly. That's rightfully so. 
Um, but at the end of the day, you should always be aware, like if you're receiving education from a group of people and like CIS is this nonprofit that exists just to create more security and to make it more ubiquitous and understandable to people who don't understand security uh, generally. It's like, great. What's the incentive there well, to educate you, to make you a more educated person? That's it. It's not to get you to choose certain tools. It's just to tell you what you should be thinking about. But then when you go to the vendor side, some portion of that vendor education, some amount of that talk some set of adjectives they have to use to describe how well their tool works exists to get you to buy more of it. That's just how it that. is. So I see that. And, I, and you know what, Connor, I've been guilty of that, right? And now, now that we have a rebrand and I'm trying to separate myself from the product in the education, you know, I've been trying to do like, for me, it was just me all alone for the last blah, blah, blah. Like, of course I'm going to talk both. Cause that's, what I had to do now as we're starting to separate and grow. Now I can go have my own voice that is purely educational. Um, you know, I've been trying really hard the last month or so, like, look at this resource from CompTIA, look at this resource from CIS, look at this resource from somebody way smarter than me trying to separate that out. But I have seen, I won't name the names, but you probably know who I'm talking about. I have seen vendors literally like, our, I have to be careful, like educating on exactly what their tool does, as opposed to educating a category or educating on a topic at large. Yeah. Right. Like, For uh, you know, our, our, you know, our purple widget is, you know, or you should buy only buy purple widgets because the purple widgets are the ones that are, you know, the most useful. And just so happens we're the only purple widget manufacturer around. Like I've seen that kind of stuff happen from vendors. And, I, and I'm trying to like not be that person, um, but it's, it's a challenge. You know, I've been called out a couple of times for trying to educate the MSPs and customer right? Because at the end of the day, our job as vendors is to help the MSP and the MSP to help the end customer. And if anywhere along that chain, we can all help each other and what's it, tides and ships and all that fun stuff, right? Yeah. For uh, this nameless Facebook user here, that that's absolutely true. Um, now, true. yeah. It, now, it could also make sense that vendors, when they educate you, they're also doing it for your benefit. So it's like it's never completely in one camp in most cases, and unless the case that you know Tim just mentioned is you need to buy this, and oh, we're the only one that bought that sells it. Good luck. Yeah, That's very clearly you know misinformed and motivated by all the wrong things. Oh, um, all right. So uh, it's Steve, uh, Steve Haviland, so a good friend of ours in our compliance uh, Facebook group. So hey, Steve is. Facebook user. I, I have, have a name. name and you can use it. It's, so it's, it's brought it up over here. And I was like, yeah. okay, it is Steve. Hey, Steve, good to see you. I don't know why it's not pulling over here on LinkedIn Live. Sorry, buddy, but thank you. Yeah. Um, so th that's what I've always advocated for is just be aware of competing incentives. Here is another secret. All of these mega review sites, G2, mm -hmm. Gartner, um, you probably know of a bunch more than I do. It's like those are just the ones that I see all the time. It's like, a lot of people say, oh, yeah, it's a magic quad quadrant um, provider, so we'll just buy them. Speaking from experience, being on the vendor side, a lot of that is pay to play. So yep. if you have a resource such as Gartner, such as G2, a company that exists to make money, you should understand where their money comes from. And in that case, it's coming from vendors paying them to get favorable recommendations. Now, they'll say yeah. that it's unbiased. They'll say blah, blah, blah. It's like, sure. And it might be that way. You might have some kind of 78 way double blind study. I don't know. But what I am saying is, well, if your money comes from the vendors, why are you recommending certain vendors? Is, is part of it because they'll pay you more? I would like to believe so just because it's just, it's another competing incentive. So that's why I advocated for like CIS controls. It's like, well, this is a nonprofit that exists to educate us in a way that they believe is correct. Now we could argue Till the sun goes down about is what CIS controls, uh, do they recommend actual things that create security? Sure, mm -hmm. let's argue about that. But what we can't argue about is that they recommend vendors because they get paid by them, because they don't. It's just they're a nonprofit that exists to serve. Yeah, I love that. You know, it's even more interesting because, you know, we're 
you know, I went back and forth with the team on, you know, listing the review sites, blah, 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 putting them on the website, all that, you know, G2 magic quadrants, all the things that are out there. And so first and foremost, I don't pay for any of them. If somebody leaves us a review on one of those sites that we happen to be listed on, it's because I put a free listing up there, period. Right. right. And so, yeah, Google reviews. Sometimes I've seen vendors offer $15, $20 gift card incentives to leave a good review, whether it's Google or any of the platforms for that matter. Um, but, you know, it's, it's always that interesting debate about social proof, right? And so back to your point, just because something is in the top, top quadrant, no, hold on, where am I? In the top quadrant, you have to consider taking in, are they on the paid program? Are they pay to play? Like do your homework and do your vendor due diligence and heck, maybe search for them on Reddit too. <laughs> Not that Reddit's the be all end all, but just because they're in the top quadrant doesn't necessarily mean that they are the right tool. Because back to our original conversation is, do the requirements align to your business needs? What are your non-negotiables? Correct. Right? Um some of the best acceptance criteria that I've ever seen just for the benefit of all of you listening also include qualities of the business that you like that have nothing to do with their tool. Like, yes, is it important to you? And it's, it's whatever is important to your company. Is it important to you that that vendor has an active space in the communities you're a part of? Is it important to you that you can talk with your account rep in person at industry events or visit their office and do so? Is Culture. it important to you that their support and their tech is on I, I, I'm on the East Coast in the U.S. is is U.S. based. All of those things are valid acceptance criteria if it's what's important to your business. Exactly. And I'm not it's, I'm not saying that you know one vendor is better than the other, but what you should where you should start is with what you need, and right. then find the vendors that have it. Like because like I said, and like um, I guess the the Facebook user that we know now, Steve. If you don't tell a vendor what you need, they'll sell you what they have. And all, like your client's not going to get the best security in that scenario. Yeah. So wrapping back up here, we've got, I don't know, roughly eight minutes left. I always try to try to leave our sessions with one key takeaway. Uh, Connor, do you have your one key takeaway or do you want me to go first? Uh, deal is choice. I could go first or you could go. There you go. I'll go first. I just said it is if it make sure you have acceptance criteria right go through what is the outcome you'd like to create for your client and then what are the set of things that you need from that tool to make that happen right if you don't have a, a super pedantic example if you don't have an internal sock right then your external sock is going to need to handle triaging reports or alerts or some something like that so is there functionality you'll need around that probably so you should definitely make that a part of your criteria and then this all wraps up into the very last sentence that I said before this wrap up, which is if you don't tell a vendor what you need, they'll sell you what they have. You and your client lose in that scenario. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome. And so we finally got Steve's name to show up because, you know, I posted it. So I don't know why Facebook <laughs> pulled the name over weird, whatever. But hey, Steve, thanks for all, thanks for all your great comments along and thanks for joining. Right. Um, as far as my key takeaway, let's do this real quick. So when you're picking and selecting a tool, not only just for your, uh, you know, your cybersecurity or for anything for that matter, Consider this process. First, have a champion. Have somebody in your business that is accountable and responsible for taking the lead. They don't have to be the, you know, CISSP. They don't have to be the, they don't like, they don't have to know everything about the thing, but they do have to be the person that's accountable. That's the first piece. The second piece is understand your own requirements as an MSP. Are you following HIPAA? Are you following CMMC? Are you following CIS? Are you not following any framework for that matter? Understand your own requirements as an MSP. Third, understand your client's requirements, right? What are their non-negotiables? What are the things that they must have in a business tool, a security tool, or whatever tool? Have them define their requirements. 
and then you and your customer align your requirements together. Once you've established what it is that you're looking for, you go back to Connor's point, right? You go back to creating that acceptance criteria, right? Being able to determine the who, the what, the how, and then start your hunt for vendor tools. Having that process in place will help you not only get better adoption, but hopefully make you a little more secure along the way. Uh, Connor, anything else you'd like to share? I was gonna, while you're doing that, go pull up next week's session. Um, anything else I'd like to share? Uh, security's hard. Don't be too hard on yourself. I'm not an expert. Very few people consider themselves experts. Um, mm. Start from a set of first principles. It's like, does this sound like this actually creates more security? Take all the mumbo jumbo buzzwords, AIX, MDR, EDR, throw that into one act. Take all that shit out. It's like, does it make sense? Does this actually create security? Super easy example. It's like, hey, if your passwords were just a little bit stronger, you're probably way more secure. All right, what if we used a password manager and didn't share admin accounts on it, but had break glass accounts with also strong passwords? It's like, mm -hmm. all right, we're probably creating a little bit more security. And if we woke up and did that every day, where would we be? We'd be in a really good spot. Absolutely. And so uh, next week, uh, two o'clock on the 28th, um, we touched a little bit here on it this time. We touched a little bit on last time. Cyber insurance and compliance. Is there an overlap? Um, so, you know, make sure you follow, like, subscribe, do the things. Keep an eye out on LinkedIn, Facebook, and all those spots. Because next week on the 28th at 2 o'clock, Connor and I will be back for our last session on cyber insurance and compliance. Two things that are near and dear to me to be able to help you as an MSP build your defensibility and build your clients defensibility. So we'll see you all in a week and uh, have a great weekend, everybody. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks, Chad. Uh, let's do this. Uh, we'll smile weirdly book. until it ends. I don't know. I thought I had one. I guess I don't. I thought I had an ending stride, but I do, but I have one, but it's not for this stream. So, hey, good luck, everybody. Have a great week. Thanks. Goodbye.